perfect. Uh, thanks so much, John, and thanks everybody for the invitation today. Um, I've already been introduced. I'm Amy McGuire. I'm a, a lecturer at Queen's University in Belfast, and I'm going to be giving you guys a really quick whistle stop tour of using Northern Irish health and social care data to understand um, mental ill health in those known social services. Now, when I'm referring to those known social services, I'm referring to children and young people. Um, and the reason that I use the term known to social services is that we include not only just looked after children and children identified as a child in need or, or CRCS uh, as um, is different terminology in Wales, uh, but also children that are referred to social services and then deemed not in need. Uh, so we've got information on everyone who's in any sort of contact with them. And to put this in sort of context, I don't need to explain to you um, the number of children in care across Northern Ireland and across the UK is increasing. And um, we know that mental health is a major concern amongst children in the care of social services um, through a variety of levels of care provision. And there are real queries around, um, is there a, a lack of um, access to treatment for children in care? Or is it that um, children end up in the care of social services or in the juvenile justice system because of a range of mental health issues that they have in the community that are not uh, um, approached or, or dealt with appropriately? And the answer is that we, we don't really know which this is, and it probably is a mixture of them all. But I mean, what's important for us to consider is that the burden of need for mental health consideration on top of removing a child from danger, placing a child somewhere safe, looking after their physical care needs is adds an extra layer of complexity to social work. And anybody who's working on the front line knows this. Um, and really what we need is more empirical evidence to suggest what these reports are, are saying, but that the message hasn't really come through to policy relating to children in care yet. We work closely um, in, in my research team with the head of the Doctor Children and Adoption Policy, Elaine Lawson in Northern Ireland, in the Department of Health. Um, and she sits on our project steering group. And one of the earliest meetings we had with her, she um, divulged that as a department, we regularly receive feedback from children's rights organizations and other stakeholders, that the right data does not exist and further development in this area is needed. So to date, we really rely on, on survey information that, that isn't really complete um, and isn't really up to date either. So this is where administrative data comes in. Now, unlike SEAL, we don't have a sort of set repository. Each of these linkages that happen um, happen on, as a one-off project linkage. And um, if you want to update the data, that's a whole new project. So for this project, what uh, I have used is GP registration information as the population spine. So in Northern Ireland, like the rest of the UK, we have NHS free at the point of service, service health system. But um, we also have uh, free prescriptions and also an integrated health and social care system, which means that social services data also contains health and care number which allows for easy linkage across um, the health data sets. Our social services are also centralized. So all the information about this is held centrally um, in a data repository in, in, in Belfast. So we linked this to prescription medication data around psychotropic medications relating to mental health, to emergency department presentations for self-harm, hospital inpatient data, and I was particularly interested in psychiatric hospital admissions, of course, death records, and then the final linkage is census data. Now, census linkage hasn't happened yet, um, but we can talk about that in the discussion uh, later, but I'm going to present on the rest. So what we're left with is a, a cohort of individuals born in Northern Ireland from 1970 onwards. And we have social services data, which um, is described by the acronym SOSCARE data from 1985 to 2015. So that's 30 years worth of information. Along the same time, we have death records that are contemporaneous. But we have information on the mental health outcomes are only available in more recent years. So medication data, hospital admissions, emergency department is from about 2010 onwards. The potential, the next step is to really to link the three censuses across this as well. But we haven't done that yet. So today, so far, I'm just going to present on what we have found using this linkage. Now, as a little caveat, um, I was pleased to see Alex's caveat, caveats before. SOSCARE data is not one data set. It contains a range of different modules of information about a child's interactions with social services. 
So it contains information on initial assessments of both the child and the parents or guardian, referral information, any open or um, ongoing child protection investigations, child care history, and then social work involvement. <clears throat> and this um, information isn't just present once, but it's present every time a child has an interaction with social services. So for some children, we have hundreds of records for their interaction with social services across all of these different modules. Um, and the real challenge in this data was to um, organize it and clean it in such a way so that we could simplify the data so that it was usable without losing any of the uh, detail or complexity in it. And what's also important to note is that health and care number must be present and complete in all of these modules to allow for linkage. So we may lose some information on one particular person's episode. Um, say, for instance, if the child protection investigation health and care number isn't correct, it won't be linked to the rest of the information about that individual. Um, but we should have a, a clear representation of at least a person's uh, involvement with social services. A little disclaimer, these are preliminary results. So I'm going to fly through quickly just a couple of um, our findings. One is from a piece of cross-sectional work that um, my PhD student carried out, um, Sarah McKenna, looking at mental health in 2015. Uh, we looked at all young people um, alive and resident in Northern Ireland in 2015, so our cohort was over half a million children. Uh, we found that over one in six of children in Northern Ireland were previously or currently known to social services. <clears throat> and to us, this is quite a large number. We don't know how this, is, um, how this relates to across the UK, but it seems quite, quite a large proportion of our children. And approximately one in 20 were currently no one social services as a child in need or a looked after child. There's about one in every classroom. <clears throat> now this chart, excuse me, identifies mental health of children currently known to social services. Um, the <clears throat> grey bar identifies individuals never known to social services. The lighter green is identified as a child in need and the darker green is a looked after child. So a child's been removed from the home and placed in external care. And what we find is for a range of mental health outcomes, there's this dose response relationship between level of social care involvement and then um, um, per mental health outcomes. <coughs> what we see is that um, children who are looked after have 10 times the rate of antidepressant prescribing, 50 times the rate of antipsychotic prescribing and 25 times the rate of self-harm compared to those children not known to social services then their associations aren't so high compared to those that are that are identified as a child in need, but um, are much higher compared to those who are never known to social services. But of course, this raises questions around direction of cause. Are these children, uh, do these children have more complex needs? Or um, is some of this due to the impact of the social service intervention itself? Would these rates have been higher if the child had remained in their own home or would they have been lower? Um, so our next steps are really to explore the data in a bit more detail to go into uh, try and tease those associations apart. Another piece of work that we've done is looking longitudinally across the data to explore mortality um, based on exposure to, to social services. And um, what we did was we looked at, at everyone um, born between 1970 and 2015 in Northern Ireland, so about one and a half million individuals born over this time period and we followed up until the end of 2019 and found that almost one in 10 individuals under 45 are or have been known to social services. So again, quite a large proportion of our population and less than 1% were looked after child. But when looking at mortality, uh, along the x-axis here, we have the three groupings of never known to social services, ever known to social services, or ever a looked after child. The lighter green is all-cause mortality, the darker green is suicide. And we can see that um, all-cause mortality is highest in those with a history of being looked after, and that suicide rates increase across all of the exposure groups, but that individuals who were ever looked after are over six times more likely to die by suicide compared to those never known to social services. What's interesting is how this relates to all suicide deaths, over one in six of all individuals under the age of 45 who die by suicide were previously known to social services. So this raises questions around, um, or should we be flagging individuals that have had any contact with social services as a potential risk factor in the future? Um, 
we've had quite a lot of hurdles handling this data and they relate uh, so much to what um, Alex was saying in the previous talk. We've got issues around data quality, timeliness, capacity, and then of course COVID. Very briefly in terms of data quality, I mentioned before about health and care number needing to be present. Um, about 20% of all records are missing a valid health and care number for linkage. This doesn't equate to 20% of individuals. It just means that we may be losing some information on, on particular individuals' um, um, care journeys or care experiences. Uh, but what's been good with this project is we do have a project steering group working very closely with the Department of Health and this our feedback to them has highlighted the need to push accurate record keeping up the agenda. So one of the major policy implications so far has been uh, a real push to ensure social services um, uh, complete health and care number on all the records and if they can't themselves have the support to be able to do so. Uh, we also had issues around care provision codes and uh, because it's historical data, it's 30 years worth of data, some foster codes and residential codes were expired and there's no data dictionary or metadata for this because it's the first time the, these, this data has been used this way before. Um, so we had to assume that some residential codes that we had no information for were, were historic or exempt or potentially incorrect. Um, in terms of, of timeliness, there are issues around uh, getting access to the data or the data custodians that work um, on collating this data and collecting it for the provision of services um, aren't getting paid to provide this information to us. The information they're providing free of charge to the Administrative Data Research Centre in Northern Ireland. So sometimes we're not very high up in their priority list, especially if we're coming back multiple times asking for, for slight edits to the downloads. Capacity was a massive one. Um, just the sheer size of the data. It's real life data, it's messy. I underestimated um, how much time and effort it would take to clean the data and make it usable. Um, and to date, it's myself and my PhD student working on it. And to be fair, we could do with another two postdocs working on, on cleaning the data. COVID is another um, hurdle in that access to the data is only within a secure safe setting, um, in person with no remote access. So the safe setting has been closed, was closed from March to August, uh, opened in August and closed again in September. So actually getting access to the data to do analysis um, has been delayed due to COVID. Um, but this is all, all we're learning from all of this in terms of data quality. What's great is the Department of Health are pushing data quality up the agenda. In terms of timeliness, the first project always takes the longest. This is the first time data has been used like this. Anyone coming after us, and there are a couple of projects coming after us, uh, we'll already have laid the tracks for that. In terms of capacity, we're trying to put together data dictionary and metadata to improve access to the data and, and data cleaning time for future projects but also future projects can just learn from the fact that, that it took us so long <clears throat> and that you do need um, a few extra hands on deck. COVID is the great unknown, um, but in terms of administrative data, I think what's fantastic about it is that we can explore whole populations. You can see from this data set, we are able to look at the entire Northern Ireland population. We should be able to compare across the UK, especially with the SEAL data sets. It allows us to have more accurate comparators when we look at children in contact with social services that it's not just compared to children never known, but what about those children that are in need and remain in their own home? And what about those children that are known to social services and then deemed not in need? We can follow up individuals after they leave care and it's relatively quick and available. So that was a whistle stop tour. Thanks so much. Uh, it's acknowledgements to everyone involved and I'm happy to take some questions. <laughs>